if you order an old fashioned anywhere in the world, except for here in Wisconsin, you're gonna get a dark, boozy drink that's made with whiskey, bitters, and sugar. It's going to be stirred. It's going to be strained. And it's going to be garnished with a simple twist of citrus. But if you order an old fashioned here in Wisconsin, your bartender is going to ask you a series of questions. Do you want brandy or do you want whiskey? And most of us are going to say brandy. And our brandy is going to get muddled with sugar and bitters, but also oranges and, of course, cherries. It's going to be muddled into a nice slushy mess. And then, there's, then it's going to either be shaken or rolled. And then it's not going to be strained. It's going to be dumped in the glass. And then there's a question. Do you want it topped with sweet or sour or press? Which stands for Presbyterian, but really means club soda. <laughs> and then there's the question of what kind of garnish? Do you want the traditional flag of an orange wrapped around a cherry? Or do you want olives? or pickled onions, or pickled mushrooms. There's no wrong answer to this question. So how did we end up drinking our old fashions differently from everyone else in the world? <laughs> well, there's one oft-told story, and it goes something like this. Back in 1893, there was an event held south of us in Chicago called the World's Columbia Exposition. You may have heard of it. Here, it's estimated that a quarter of the country's population at the time attended the fair. And because of Wisconsin's proximity to Illinois and the fact that four railroad lines transported passengers to the White City, it's assumed that many Wisconsinites attended the fair. And here they saw and tasted things they had never before experienced. They got to ride Ferris wheels, try out newfangled technology like zippers. They got to taste juicy fruit, cream of wheat, even Captain Pabst entered his beer into a contest, which he won. If you went to the woman's pavilion, you got to taste the world's first brownies made by the Palmer House chefs. And if you went to the California Pavilion, there you met the three Corbell brothers who were sampling their grape elixir. So Wisconsinites went to the fair and fell in love with Corbell's brandy, and that's why we drink brandy. It seems logical, it's got some history, and it sounds like it very well could be true. But just like maraschino cherries with their artificial red dye bear little semblance to fresh Door County cherries just picked off the tree? So does this story have anything to do with the truth about why we drink brandy here in Wisconsin? So before I tell you the real reason we drink brandy, I have to explain how this tall tale, or false news, and by fake news, I don't mean something that you disagree with. I mean something that's not true. Before I explain that to you, I have to explain how this myth got started and perpetuated. Like many bits of fake news, it started out as an actual news story published in a northern Illinois newspaper in the early aughts. This story was discussing how Corbell champagne was being served at President Obama's congressional inaugural luncheon. The story then detailed the local connection, how Corbell brandy was displayed at the fair. Then the writer or writers, because this was a non-byline story, stated 
The many Germans who attended the fair became Corbell's best brandy customers. And today, Wisconsin, with its large German population, buys more brandy than any other state. It even noted that the USS Wisconsin was christened with Corbell Viking Champagne. Well, this story must be true. It was published in a newspaper, right? Except this reporter or reporters did not follow the old Chicago newspaper maxim. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> but how did a story in a little Illinois newspaper end up in Wisconsin and spread beyond? Well, a Madison opinion writer was researching the fair, and he stumbled upon this story online. And he told his readers, for 30 years, I have wondered why Brandy. He said this was his eureka moment. Now, presumably, some Wisconsin residents read the story, but more importantly, some Wisconsin bartenders read the story. And bartenders, well, they like to tell stories. So they retold this story. And then any modern spirits writers who were asking that same question, why brandy in Wisconsin? Well, they repeated the story. This story has been repeated in newspapers, in magazines, even some Wisconsin history books. And I have to admit, I myself repeated the story in an article I wrote. But I knew when I began researching my book about Wisconsin cocktails that I had to nail down the real reason we drink brandy. And I had to have it backed up with historical evidence, not just conjecture. So I began researching the modern day equivalent of newspaper microfiche and combing through pages, and files at local historical societies. But the more I checked this story out, the less it actually checked out. I learned that Corbell was at the fair, and they did sample their brandy, but so did 25 other California wineries. And not only that, there was no evidence of any uptick in brandy sales here in Wisconsin after the fair. However, there was an uptick in brandy sales someplace else. The German government in Germany, after the fair, made their largest purchase ever of American brandy. I also discovered a very, very curious story published in the Milwaukee Journal in 1894, just one year after the fair. The reporter was talking about a new cocktail revolution that was afoot in Milwaukee saloons. He wrote, for the young German men of Milwaukee, beer was too tame for them. Beer was enough for their fathers, but for them, there are other mysterious worlds to explore. He then started talking about the most popular cocktails in the city. Now, there was one brandy cocktail called the Morning Glory, but made with absinthe and anisette. It's nothing like anything we drink today with brandy in it. There was, however, one cocktail. You may have heard of it. It was the most popular cocktail in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, in 1894. It was called the Old Fashioned but it was made with whiskey, bitters, and sugar. Well, this was my aha moment. We used to drink old fashions like everyone else in the world. So what happened between 1894 and now? Well, it's not this romantic story about falling in love with Brandy at the fair. No, it was more practical. It was a case of access and then marketing. The Milwaukee Journal in 1975 
published a Sunday magazine expose and feature entitled Brandy Mania. And the reporter interviewed everyone he could talk to about why we drink brandy. And some people said, yeah, it's kind of like UFOs. It just sort of happened. But he also interviewed a gentleman who had been involved in the liquor distribution business since 1938. And this man said, yeah, we drank a little bit more brandy, but two times nothing is still a great big nothing. We really didn't start drinking brandy in any great quantities until after World War II. Now, after World War II, there was a lot of bad booze going around because some of our whiskey distilleries would ship grain over to Europe. They'd shut down, the grain would get shipped, and then we'd get stuck with bad booze. If you read any of the police blotters of the time, tavern owners were cited for putting bad booze into good booze bottles. And it was right here when our liquor distributors caught wind that the good Christian brothers of California had discovered an aging cache of brandy. So they bought it all up. I confirmed this story with a news brief in a section entitled Wham Doodles. A Midwest state liquor monopoly finds itself with enough brandy to float a battleship, which would be an exhilarating experience for the barnacles. <laughs> so here in Wisconsin, were you gonna get your old fashioned made with bad whiskey or good brandy? Rot gut rum or good brandy? Well, we're smart here in Wisconsin. We knew the correct answer to this question. So we started drinking our way through all those brandy barrels. There were 30,000 barrels that came gushing into our state at one time. That's enough to fill 6 million bottles, 1.5 million gallons, or two and a half Olympic-sized pools. We were swimming in good brandy. Now, as we started drinking our way through those pools, other brandy makers noticed that, hey, they're drinking a lot of brandy here in, there in Wisconsin. So they started selling and marketing their brandy to us. And so did Corbell. Corbell stopped brandy production during Prohibition, but in the 1960s when they started it up, they had a very clever marketing slogan. A nickel more per drink and worth it, which played on our thrifty sensibilities. So we became their best customers and we remain their best customers. Now, as for the fruit and the soda, well, that was added during Prohibition. And here in Wisconsin, once we like something, we stick with it. So after Prohibition, the bartending slang here in Wisconsin for an old fashioned was called a fruit salad. So why did this real story of brandy mania get lost in historical newspaper archives? but the myth of the Columbia Exposition get perpetuated. Well, back in the 1970s, the life cycle of a story was shorter. It would appear in a newspaper, might go out on the wire, or appear in a broadcast outlet, but then it was over and done with. Now, whether a story appears in print or broadcast, it usually ends up online. And where do you get a lot of your news? But more importantly, where do you share most of your news? Well, you share it online and through social media. So theoretically, a fake news or false story or misinformation can live forever. So how do you protect yourself against bad information? Well, you can remain skeptical, especially of anything that sounds too perfect, too pat. You can also do your own research, but more importantly, if you find out that your assumptions are wrong, you can remain humble and willing enough to change them. I'll remind you of that old Chicago newspaper maxim. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. And I'll drink to that. Cheers. <laughs>